Jim here and thanks for joining in. If you're a diver or if you know a diver, you're aware that wreck diving is a pinnacle event for divers. And that's because wrecks are interesting in themselves and they attract fish, which attract bigger fish. Um, so they're kind of like a natural reef. They're a great place to dive. And today we're going to talk about a very special place in the world, which is Chuuk in Micronesia, located here. During World War II, Chuuk was a Japanese stronghold. In fact, it was known as the Gibraltar of the Pacific. The Allied attack on Chuuk in February of 1944 was roughly the equivalent of a Pearl Harbor for the Japanese, which resulted in a mess of wrecks in the Chuuk Lagoon, which is a bonanza for divers. Uh, today we're going to talk to Michael Gherkin, who is a dive operator who runs a boat and a service and uh, photography touring in that area. And Mike is going to tell us all about uh, diving Chuuk. And all of the pictures uh, here are credit to Michael, who is one of the best underwater photographers I've ever seen. Let's have a look. All right, thanks, Mike. So everybody knows uh, I see you're running trips in Chuuk and in North Carolina. Uh, those uh, sand tiger shark wrecks in North Carolina. Uh, I see you have events listed for 2022 and 2023. Is that right? Yeah. When I'm, you know, I, I uh, have a business called Evolution Dive Travel. And uh, up until the uh, pandemic started, um, it was doing pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously, I haven't been running any trips uh, for the last year and a half and canceled numerous others uh so i'm hoping i'm hoping for uh 2022 for a reboot uh on everything right uh, on the topic of vaccines i read from your blog that you were involved in distributing vaccines uh, all around the smaller islands of micronesia uh, with your dive boat tell us about that uh that's correct the the owners of the odyssey uh have allocated the <clears throat> the boat to deliver uh, public outreach vaccination teams to the numerous uh, villages spread out around more than a dozen islands within the within the lagoon, mm -hmm. uh, and while they're delivering J and J, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, uh, to some of the people, they're they're mostly doing Moderna, which has required uh, two trips to to each one of these remote locations. So we're not doing too bad considering where we are. Off your site, you've mentioned that you've had a lot of downtime due to COVID as we have all, and you've been taking a lot of photos, doing a lot of exploration. What is it that you usually do in your business there during the on time? What's your function? Well, when I'm, my, my primary job is captain of the Liverboard uh, Odyssey. Uh, and so my side, my side job is photography and uh, a sub sub job on that is is photography dive travel. Uh, so when I'm not working doing other things, uh, I I try to run trips uh, where photographers uh, come and, and try to hone their skills. And quite often there's a lot of attendees that uh, come on my trips who don't even have, own a camera. Hmm. Uh, they just they just want a professional guide uh, to the wrecks or, or to the to whatever you know venue it is that I'm, that I'm uh, taking them to whether it's uh, we, we do formalized photography workshops and informal as well I mean some of the best learning experiences come from uh, sitting around the, the table at dinner you know talking shop uh, that's kind of what I do got it so the dates that you have announced for upcoming trips on your sites uh, Chuk 2022 and 2023 for example uh, are those photography oriented only trips? How does that work? Yeah, it can be. Uh, for example, I have a, a, a what I call a rec tech trip running running in uh, truck in 2022, and I'm and I'm looking at the roster, and surprisingly, there's there's uh, less than half of the people are attendees are, are keen photographers or videographers. Uh, uh, some of them just have GoPros, you know. Um, <laughs> So the photography is a big draw, but it, like I said before, it's not the only reason why uh, travelers uh, use my services. I see. Thanks for that. Uh, as for your photography, um, I've got to tell you what I really like about your photos. When I look at those photos with divers especially, 
it looks like a picture of the reason why I and maybe a lot of people learned how to dive. Uh, you seem to do particularly well of, of capturing and like freezing time of a superhero flying through a wreck or over the top of a wreck. It looks like what diving was meant to be. What is it you're thinking while you're composing these shots? Well, I mean, quite simply, I'm just trying to excite. I want photos that excite people to want to go diving. Uh, and, and our entertainment is is what I do. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, with each photo, represent as best I can uh, what the divers, what we are experiencing, what we see down there. And try to try to portray the the atmosphere, uh, the mood, which is impossible to do, uh, but you do the best you can with you know with the photo. Got it. Well, Mike, you seem to capture that spirit as well or better than than anyone else I've I've seen. Uh, I know obviously lighting is important to all photography. Uh, your subjects are usually carrying a light because uh, they're in a wreck. Um, but there's also usually an interesting backlighting effect in most of your pictures, I've noticed. Uh, what's your philosophy or goal with lighting when you're taking these photos? Well, all photography requires light. Without it, all you have is, is black. Uh, so you need to look at the, any photo that you take and, and just determine what do you want to be illuminated. You know what? What do you want the viewer to see? Um, and with underwater photography specifically, uh, you have your built-in uh, lights, which are you know your strobes or your flash guns, as some people call them, uh, which which will light up the foreground. You know anything that's in front of you. Uh, but with creative lighting underwater, you can use high-powered video lights uh, to light up. The background or areas of the background that are relevant to whatever photo it is that you're taking and with the technology today with underwater lighting systems uh, it makes these photos that you're referring to uh, of mine it makes them possible without the use of uh, surface supply power uh, cumbersome cables uh, or photographers in the past would use these slave triggers on strobes uh, which were very cumbersome to work with and often did not did not fire the strobe. Uh, so now they have these video lights, uh, you know, 33,000 or even higher that are, can hold in the hand. Uh, so by mounting a clamp to the light, I can position it just about anywhere I want inside the rack. Definitely. Uh, helps for creative lighting. Okay, gotcha. I do remember the slave systems uh, for flash lighting. Um, so now instead of that, you're using constant illumination with these video lights, is that right? Yeah, there's other, there's numer numerous ways to, to add lighting to your images underwater. Um, mine is with video lights, uh, constant lights. There's different ways you can do it. It's, mm -hmm. it's called creative lighting. Being creative means experimenting with different lighting techniques. Okay, I see. So on the photos I'm looking at for this series, uh, I see side mount. Are most of these trips you're running, are these uh, technical dives with deco or are they recreational dives? Uh, what's going on there? Yeah, uh, in Truck Lagoon specifically, I'll be specific with truck. It's, uh, it's all skill levels, really. Truck Lagoon can appeal to a beginner diver as much as a highly skilled technical diver. A diver with additional skills will be able to appreciate and get more out of the wrecks in truck than a beginner. But that doesn't mean beginner divers have walked away disappointed. Mm -hmm. They have been, uh, you know, uh, awestruck by what they see here. And it just it means that they, they want to come back. So we have a, a lot of repeat business here in Chuuk due to the vastness of the, the dive sites, mm -hmm. the steep history, and the, the abundant marine life that the wrecks have. There's so much to see and do here that they, we often get a lot of repeat, uh, repeat divers here. So the, the trips that I host specifically, uh, my marketing twist on it is called Wreck Tech. Mm -hmm. So it's two weeks on board the Odyssey, first week being uh, dive sites that are, that are just beyond, just beyond the edge of recreational limits, uh, but technical diving is still 
still permitted. However, the, the second week is called Tech Week, which we focus on the less often visited deeper dive sites that are beyond recreational limits and, and ranges of you know, 40 to 60 plus meters. Gotcha. And how is uh, mixed gas availability in Chuuk? Uh, is helium a thing there? The Odyssey supplies uh, helium as well as oxygen. Uh, however, helium is very expensive and, and it tends to appeal to the closed circuit rebreather diver uh, mm. without getting into too much technicality. Uh, they, they consume a lot less uh, helium uh, on a dive than somebody diving without a rebreather on open circuit. Uh, but we do, ha we do have helium for, for sale. It's popular gas to use for the tech deeper dive sites. Yeah, I hear you. You know, ever since I've been tech diving, uh, maybe as far as 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, helium has always been running out. Uh, it's been running out for more than two decades uh, that I know of, and I guess it must be getting expensive. Yeah, it's it's getting it's it's very expensive, and then add on ship shipment uh, all the way to Chuuk, and then you're talking about uh, a big financial commitment to the diver. Uh, but some people they don't mind, of course they they have the means, so they'll run up, you know, they'll use it. Uh, I tend to just use air and um, variations of nitrox uh, along with oxygen for decompression on my dives. Uh, I suppose if I was a very wealthy man, I would <laughs> I would use helium all the time, but uh, it's prohibitively expensive. What are some of your favorite wrecks in Chuuk? I often get asked that question, uh, what's what's my favorite dive site? And, Honestly, there's there's so many good wrecks here. I don't have a I don't single out one one site. Uh, I, I think uh, that my favorite wreck site changes depending on uh, the photos that I'm yielding at that time. You know, certain wrecks I get very excited about when I'm when I'm getting some uh, some uh, good photograph photographs. Uh, and then they often fade from my memory uh, when a new, newer, exciting uh, dive site comes up. San Francisco Maru and Nippo Maru, uh, Hoki Maru. Uh, the, uh, they're all a Fumazuki destroyer. Uh, there's also a Japanese submarine here called the I-169. And uh, that's a pretty intense dive as well. I've had a lot of uh, exciting uh, penetration dives on that dive on that wreck site. Uh, and there's many more. There's, you know, there's, in, in a two-week itinerary, we'll dive approximately 20 to 24, 25 different wrecks uh, with no repeats wow. in, in a two-week period. So 12 days of diving, doing at least two wreck sites a day. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting place uh, to dive as far as diversity is concerned. Oh my God, that's incredible. Two wrecks a day for up to two weeks. That's just incredible. Um, how does the wreck penetration work there? Are most of the wrecks pretty open for access or are there lines laid out? Uh, how does that work? Penetration on, on the wrecks varies from very easy, where you have ambient light behind you, you know, uh, so to speak, or ahead of you. Uh, and then also there's penetration dives where you're in zero light with uh, heavy silting and entanglement hazards. So the, depending on your skill set, your comfort level, your training, uh, your experience, etc., depends on uh, what you should and shouldn't do here in truck as far as uh, uh, penetrating inside the wrecks. And as a guide with more than, I don't know, probably three, 4,000 dives here in Chuuk, that's one of the reasons why people tend to, to pick us, Odyssey and myself, is, is uh, so we can get people in and out of the, of the wrecks uh, safely and show them all the highlights. And not just for the penetration dives, but uh, there's a lot of artifacts to see on the outside that you might, you might uh, uh, swim right past without seeing unless you have... Uh, uh, a guide showing you what you're looking at. Mike, do you have any favorite photos or series of photos you want to tell us about? Well, uh, for Truck Lagoon specifically, my favorite photographs are the ones that were the most difficult to take. 
And those are, are generally what we call engine room photos. Uh, the wrecks of truck lagoon, uh, the most intense part of most of the dives here is accessing the confines of the engine room. And many of the engine rooms still have intact gauge panels and equipment. It's an atmosphere that uh, it's hard to capture in photography, especially because of the silting and the low light. Uh, so uh, if you look through any number of my, especially my most recent Truck Lagoon photos, my, my what I call stuck in truck series of photos, uh, you'll see a lot of engine room shots in there. And my models were friends of mine, and they did a fantastic job of setting up these photos for me. And um, those are my favorites. Uh, there's too many to name, you know, in this short interview. Mm. Um, but with North Carolina, which is my other uh, destination that I specialize in, I was a captain on a boat there for, uh, I, I forget, six years or more, for six seasons. We, we have a five to six month season there. And photographing the, the sharks, uh, specifically the sand tiger sharks, uh, which are, live on those wrecks in abundance. Um, so any one of the, the shark photos uh, that you can see in my North Carolina portfolio are my favorites as well. Yeah, North Carolina and the sand tigers uh, sound just amazing. I've seen pictures of there. It's a must-do. Uh, I'll include some of those photos if I can. Yeah, it's pretty exciting diving out there in North Carolina. It's it's very different than Truck Lagoon uh, in that for me you you know you're you're seeking out interaction with uh, the marine life. You know uh, the wrecks are historic as can be, but they're they're not uh, as intact as the wrecks in Truck Lagoon. The the Truck Lagoon wrecks. Um, some of you may some of you some of your viewers or listeners may may say, oh, I hear the wrecks are falling apart. Uh, there's some truth to that. The wrecks are indeed doing what wrecks do. They're falling apart, but they have not reached to the, to, they have not gotten to the point where they are of um, uh, uninterest to the diver, uh, especially if you're a new diver here and you have nothing to compare it to from 20 years ago uh, or even 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, I'm often asked how many years do you think it's going to be before divers are not going to want to dive them anymore because, you know, they become piles of rubble. And I, I think personally think it's going to be a long time. Got it. Yeah. And on that point, uh, there are still World War I wrecks out there, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. You can have uh, the famous uh, scuttled fleet of Scapa Flow. And there's also a World War I wreck, uh, one wreck that I'm aware of in Guam. Uh which I cannot remember the name of. And there's another one, I believe, uh, from World War I era that was sunk, in, sunk uh, after the war, World War II was over. But the, uh, my history is right. The Prince Eugen in Kwajalein is also World War I. So, yeah, there's still, there's still a lot of uh, old wrecks to see that are still fairly intact. Well, Mike, thanks so much for your time. And, and with the, the connection here, it was a bit of a challenge for us. Uh, the delay was amazing. I had to really cut this up. Uh, any last words for folks out there? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm looking forward to the reopening of the FSM, the Micronesia, where I, I can take a break. <laughs> I've been here for about a year and a half. I'm looking forward to rejoining the rest, rest of the world uh, out there. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your interest. Uh, in my work, and uh, thanks for your patience with the communication uh, that, I'm, that I'm dealing with here. Good stuff. All right. And by the way, last, last question. Where is home for you, Mike? <clears throat> I'm a bit of a nomad, but I have family in Long Island that I visit, uh, Long Island, New York, that I visit, uh, well, I used to visit once a year. I also spend a lot of time in North Carolina, and oh. um, I, I try to spend uh, four different, depends on the time of year, depends on where you might find it. Got it. All right. As a last note, uh, this interview was conducted. Mike was on his boat in Chuuk uh, with a 3G connection. And so we had an amazing delay, more of a delay than I've ever had on any conversation. So I really had to cut this up. 
and uh, with Mike, because of that connection, he went with a profile picture instead of a video. Okay, well, thanks again for joining in and having a look. Um, if Truk is something that you'd be interested in, please go ahead, feel free, have a look at Mike's uh, webpage and uh, the, the dates for trips. Uh, you know, obviously, he's a very professional and knowledgeable person to do one of these trips with. I'm even considering it, actually, or in North Carolina. Um, have a look. Also, as you know, we have Patreon now and our channel is growing, so if you'd like to hop on the crew, please do uh, subscribe. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our newest uh, patrons. That will be in the, uh, in the scroll at the end. And until then, I will, as usual, see you at the beach.